Hello everyone. So it's our third week, so I thought maybe we should start talking about chemical reactions at some point, you know, before the semester's over. So here's the point where we're going to start doing this. This is chapter three in your text. Uh, we had to get some definitions and basics out of the way first. So um, this chapter assumes you know a little bit about chemical equations already. If you don't, you really shouldn't have gotten to this course. You should be back in the introductory level course. Um, because I don't have time to teach you two courses in one semester. So some of this stuff should be reviewed. If it's not, be aware. So first principle, the idea of stoichiometry is a way that we talk about amounts in chemical reactions so that we can actually work with them. A chemical equation on a sheet of paper is one thing. Being able to go in the lab and know the right amounts to put in and what to expect to get out is another. And so that's where stoichiometry comes in. And it all comes down to the law of conservation of mass put together by Lavoisier in the 1789. Um, the idea being that in a chemical reaction, mass does not get created nor destroyed. So it seems obvious in hindsight, now that we've had a couple of centuries to get used to it, and you've had previous courses in chemistry to get used to it, but at the time, it was not so obvious. At the time, the big problem was chemical reactions involving gases. Gases were poorly understood, and so it would appear that some reactions got heavier and some reactions got lighter, um, and there was no logic behind them. As it turned out, generally that was a reaction that either absorbed a gas, like iron rusting to make you know, iron rusting makes iron ox iron three oxide, which is going to be heavier than the amount of iron because of the oxygen that was added to it. Or things like a carbonated a carbonated soda, if you left it out, the carbon dioxide would be removed from that, and so it would appear, in the absence of other knowledge, that the sample actually lost mass. Uh, it turned out that the big uh, innovation to solve that was basically sealing things up, put a cap on it. Um, not particularly a difficult concept. Again, hindsight makes a lot of things more obvious, but this is one that had been known for centuries before that because winemaking is one of the oldest written chemical processes on earth. Um, and if you don't seal up wine while it ferments, what you get is vinegar. So it's a well-known, literally millennia old concept that you need to close off some, what we now know as chemical reactions to keep air or whatever the ancients might have called it you know demons out so we finally got there in the scientific terms in the 1700s that gases exist and therefore if we want to keep our mass consistent we have to keep them from coming in and out of our reactions so that's what that's part of what Lavoisier has uh, gets credit for is figuring out that you know if you want a soda to be good later put the cap back on and put it back in the fridge and it won't it won't lose all its fizz so with that, we go to Dalton, we'll talk about another chapter and atomic theory, which leads us basically in a straight line to modern chemistry. So while it seems obvious to us now, at the time it obviously it was not, and it made a big impact on our ability to systemize chemistry. Chemistry at that point was almost just a set of random observations, because if you couldn't trust mass, how do you interpret a chemical reaction? So somebody had to be the one to figure out how to make mass stay consistent. That answer happened to be sealing up reactions to keep gases in or out. So there are basically five real types of chemical reactions, and even one of those is not always referred to as a separate type. Here are three of them. Um, combinations, where we have something like this where we have multiple components coming together and we only get a single product. This is the dream. No waste, no leftovers, no byproducts, just the product that we wanted. And it is not common, as you might expect. Very rarely does nature give you the ideal case with no leftovers and no waste. So there are cases where it works. They are sadly very rare for us. We generally don't get off that light. Um, conceptually, you can think about the reverse of that as a reaction where I only had a single reactant on the left side, and I get multiple products out of it. So these two are easy to recognize. 
If I'm looking at a chemical reaction that only has a single product, it's a combination. If I'm looking at a chemical reaction that only has a single reactant, it's a decomposition. That's the only two possibilities. Those are obvious. Um, the other two, which are not on this slide, are single replacement and double replacement. Now, we have to talk a little bit more before we're going to get to understanding those, but in those cases, we're either looking at something elemental, which then produces something elemental on the other side, um, or we're looking at something where I have two different compounds, and in the end, I still have all compounds, no elemental substances here, uh, or at least not elemental substances on both sides. Um, so those are the those are the ones. A combustion reaction typically is a specific type of double replacement, although that's not really what it means. Combustion reaction is not a separate type in terms of how the atoms work. Combustion reaction is just a reaction that involves oxygen as a reactant. So basically, if I burn things, combust them, um, that is a reaction with oxygen and generally something to ignite it. Um, although that's not always required. And I tend to get simpler products out of it. So we'll look at some examples of that, but that's, a, that's kind of an odd case because it doesn't really specify how atoms, how bonds are broken and formed, just that oxygen is one of the reactants. So it, some books will not include that as a type. Your book does. I'm going to stick with it since that's what you're reading as backup. Okay, so... Here's our generic combination reaction here, and this is what they look like, is that I'm combining two different, pro two different reactants and I'm getting a single product. It does not have to be elemental. The first two examples here are where I've got carbon and oxygen giving me carbon dioxide. Um, I've got nitrogen and hydrogen giving me ammonia. But they can still be compounds. It's less common to see a combination reaction using compounds, but the bottom case here is one. Uh, calcium oxide and water both compounds no single element substances here and out of that I'm getting calcium hydroxide in solution so um, a few details that should be always included one um, when you write out a reaction it should describe phases so solid liquid gas or if it's in water AQ um, two as much as possible we'd like to have details if there are any so above and below the reaction arrow will be what are called conditions. That could be things in an experimental sense like time, like temperature, like pressure, things that are not bonded to either side of the reactant or products but are necessary to get it done. So for instance, if I take natural gas like this um, and combine it with oxygen, in the absence of conditions, it's not doing anything, ever. Or at least at no rate you're going to be around to see. It's too slow to do anything. But if I combine that with a very specific condition, a spark, to ignite this, well, then it's a very energetic reaction, and I get carbon dioxide and water out of it. Now, we'll talk more about that in the combustion reaction, but that's the idea. Sometimes conditions are required. Um, sometimes they're rather extensive, like this middle case to make ammonia, is a very, very extensive set of conditions. Um, it is very much less simple than what you see written there. We're not going to dwell on that, but it's just in case you see a reaction written with something above or below the arrow, those are just additional condition details. Sometimes they're incidental, just observations, uh, like a reaction that changes colors or something like that. Uh, but more commonly, they're requirements. What solvent did you use? How long did it go? What temperature? Did it require a spark? So those are things that should be there because without some of those, at least, the reaction is not going to work. Okay, now, in terms of simple combinations, um, metal and non-metal combinations, you should, generally speaking, be able to work out what's going to happen there because you know what the charges are in each group. So the example they're giving you here, while it's kind of hard to read, is this. I have magnesium metal and I have oxygen gas. 
and what does it give me? Well, if I'm combining a metal and a non-metal, if they react, then I'm looking at getting an ionic compound out of it. So I need to know what ions are going to form. Magnesium is in group 2A, so as an ion, it forms magnesium 2+. Plus. Oxygen is in group 6, so as an ion, it forms a 2-. minus. The combination of those two to get a neutral ionic compound is one of each. So that's magnesium oxide. So that, under these conditions, will be a solid. We're going to talk later on in this chapter about the fact that this still doesn't add up. This is a violation of Lavoisier. I have atoms here on one side that aren't there on the other. I have one magnesium on each side of my top equation here. I don't have the same number of oxygens. So to make this work, I actually have to balance it and put coefficients in place. Otherwise, I can't make this reaction line up with the law of conservation of mass. So that's not the point of this particular example, but you need to be able to work out quickly from their position on the table what the charge is for the main group elements, either metal or non-metal, and then their combination to make a neutral element, which is generally going to be crisscrossing these numbers. Now, assuming they're not divisible by the same thing. In this case, they are. So instead of Mg2O2, it's Mg and O, applying the one for each. Next type, decomposition reactions. Now, generally here, we're looking at reactions that get us simpler products. So the formulas on the right side of a decomposition reaction are typically smaller. So look at the first example we're given here, KClO3, and I'm looking at much less complex, just KCl or O2 molecules. I'm looking at less complexion, less complex formula-wise and structure-wise products. So this tends to be very favorable. Um, complex things are generally going to head towards being broken down. It's a, pro it's a concept called entropy that we'll deal with in general chem 2. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but the idea is this is much more common than the magical combination we saw in the previous example where we're only getting one product. A, a single reactant breaking down is not all that rare. It happens a lot. Um, oddly, and I don't understand why they did this, they give you a great example of a decomposition reaction, the airbag here. They tell you what it is, but they don't include it as an example. That's just sloppy. This is sodium azide. Under the right conditions, it breaks down to sodium and nitrogen gas. The sodium can undergo further reactions depending on conditions. The nitrogen gas is released quickly and hot, and that fills the airbag, and so when you have an accident, you don't die. Um, Quite bluntly, the cars that were around when I grew up without airbags, a car accident could easily be fatal. Now, a fatal car accident generally involves some really serious craziness, like getting hit by a truck or hitting a, hitting a brick wall at 90 miles an hour. Um, most normal traffic car accidents now are generally not fatal. So um, the airbag or airbags, depending on your car, is a massive safety improvement and it basically is a really tiny amount of sodium azide which is a which is a small explosive um, in those little in those little bags uh, with a little bag over them and as you if you collide with anything a little electrical switch gets thrown starts this reaction and inflates the bag um, it's also why if you ever have an accident like that you can't just replace the airbag easily because it is technically uh, shock sensitive explosive so you can't really just expect the average garage to be going and banging that in there with a hammer um, that wouldn't end well so it requires some specialty tools and skills to actually put that back in safely without anybody getting hurt and it's usually just sold as a package for that reason anyway a decomposition that's particularly useful and one which hopefully you never get to experience all right so um, one more type we can actually do some predictions on is carbonates if I heat up carbonates, you can kind of see what's going on there. I have a carbon with some extra oxygen detached. 
very likely I'm going to see something like carbon dioxide happen. And that happens with most carbonates. If I heat them up enough, I'll drive off carbon dioxide and I'll get left with just the oxide as my ionic compound. So um, we, we can use that in a number of different ways in terms of understanding what we had structurally, uh, what we had formula-wise. Um, and if you're in the lab course, you'll actually talk about what that would look like rather than do it this semester. All right, next type, combustion reactions. Um, as I said, this is basically reactions with oxygen and uh, generally some ignition source. So again, they're giving an example and not telling you what it is. This is propane, C3H8 as a, as a gas. If I combine that with oxygen and a condition of a spark, uh, what I get is carbon dioxide and water. So if you look at it on its face, it looks like a double replacement. One carbon, the carbons ended up with an oxygen. The H's ended up with the other oxygen. So it is kind of double replacement-ish, uh, but it's more complicated than that. So that's why your book has chosen to kind of leave it on its own as a combustion reaction. Um, actually, what's going on there is much more complex than it looks formula-wise because it's, this is a relatively complicated structure and you have to break basically every bond in it. Well, basically, you have to break every single bond in it as part of a combustion. So it is uh, a lot more complex than the formulas would lead you to believe. We'll talk more about that when we get to uh, molecular structure in terms of understanding some, some different types of reactions. All right, so... Here's the version of that that I said they didn't provide, so that's what I get for not going forward a slide and just keep ranting. So here's what that looks like in model terms. So they're using a simpler case here. Um, oddly, they used a different model example than the equation. These are CH4 models, and this is propane. We'll let that go. Um, CH4 is natural gas, so that's your Bunsen burner in a lab, okay. Um, the idea is, if you notice, there are C's and H's attached here, there are O's attached to each other here, and on the right, there's none of that. It's all gone. Same thing for propane. Every bond that was there on one side is gone on the other side. So it is, it is a little more complex than it looks. So that's why energetically, most of the time would require some sort of spark, and after that, the energy of the burning is driving the next reaction. So it keeps going once you start it. When we want to talk about quantities, though, which was the, the topic of this chapter, first we need that balanced chemical equation. Then we need some information about the components in it. And that is specifically things from the periodic table, um, sometimes called the formula weight, which is a, an older term that's not used as much now. Um, sometimes called the molecular weight because we are very, very commonly dealing with covalent compounds. So we have molecules, not empirical formulas. Not all the time. Um, many people use the terms interchangeably. Um, the third is to call it molar mass. So we'll talk about that one a little bit later because in these cases, we're still in the magical AMU units. Now, what's an AMU unit. So if I'm looking at the periodic table and I have my basic pieces of data, the atomic number and the atomic mass, well, the atomic mass is reported in atomic mass units or AMU. That doesn't help me when I walk into a lab. I don't have anything there I can actually work with in a lab setting. It doesn't tell me anything. So, This is where we get to the mole. Now, we will never actually use this number, and it's not even written correctly. This is not even correct. It should be 6.02. Um, we will never use this number in a calculation. If you find yourself writing this out, you've already missed the question. I refuse to ask them because uh, generally we don't care about how many atoms or how many molecules are in our substance with rare exceptions. I'm not interested in those exceptions. So we're not going to be bothered with that. We need conceptually to understand what it does. 
So here's what it does. It allows us to take that molecule with its atomic mass unit units for this actual formula or structure and convert it to something we can weigh in a lab, which I horribly just wrote right over. So that's 18.0 grams for one mole. So it allows us to actually have a mass, something we can weigh. You remember those five things we can measure that we deal with in chemistry all the time? Uh, temperature, time, volume, length, and the last one, mass. So we need that. Now, our chemical equations will get us moles. So we'll have this from the equation itself, at least a ratio of it. And then we can go directly to a balance in the lab and begin to work because we can get a mass to work with. So this is where the third term I mentioned comes in, molar mass, is that we're dealing with the atomic mass, the formula weight or the, the molecular weight converted to grams per mole units. Um, as I said, many people use these terms interchangeably. Uh, realistically, this is the one you should be using all the time. And, you know, occasionally I will slip up because I learned it the other way. But this is what you really should be using to describe um, your molar masses as we go along because you want them in terms of moles. We don't care about atomic mass units. We need things in terms that we can use so that we can go to a lab and actually do the reactions instead of just writing things on paper. So next on our list of, for the moment, slightly disconnected topics is something called percent composition. And it looks like this. We're looking at the mass of one element over the mass of the molecule times 100. So here's what that means. Let's say that I want the percent hydrogen in CH4. So for the moment, we'll just use rounded numbers to make our lives easier. H, the molar mass is 1. And for C, it is 12. Which means for CH4, it is 16. So here's what that looks like. We're assuming for this composition that we're dealing with one mole. So what that means is that in this formula, CH4, I have four hydrogen, at hydrogen atoms. And so I'm going to put that down for, for one mole. One mole of CH4 gives me, is, has four moles of H. So if I say that here, four moles of H times 1.0 grams per mole for H. On the bottom, I'm going to have one mole of CH4, and that is 16.0 grams per mole of CH4 times 100%. So that works out to 4 over 16 times 100% which is 25%. Now, again, I've taken the relatively simple atomic masses just to make my life simpler. Um, to be really accurate about it, we would go with the full one, you know, the full ones, 1.00794 1 and 12.011. Um, so this is not a perfect number, but this is how we go about the calculations. So we just have better numbers here and here. So I'd have a better, a better sum here. Um, than this one. So that's that's where it would come from. But as we talk about analysis of formulas, getting to the empirical formula and how we prove a structure that we have, the percent composition is one way to go about that. So we'll, we'll talk more about it, but this is how we go about it. So if we had the percent composition, we can relatively quickly get to an empirical formula. A little bit cumbersome the first time you do it. So um, basically, it's the reverse of what I did in the previous calculations. It's, it's using a percent composition and what I know of the elements from the periodic table 
to work out how many of them are in an empirical formula. We cannot go directly to a molecular formula this way because we don't know that the empirical formula and a molecular formula are the same thing without more information. So that's why we're using this. Even though we're going to be talking about covalent compounds sometimes, we're still going to be looking at empirical formulas here without additional information. We can't get to the molecular formula from the empirical formula. We need to know how many empirical formulas are the real thing. So, for instance, if you remember what I said in the first one, this is an empirical formula for glucose. This is the actual formula. So, that has a multiplier of 6. I don't know that <laughs> from this type of calculation. I don't know what goes here, which means I don't know this either. But I can get this. With additional information, then I could get all the way to the molecular formula. Let's take an example. Um, this is this is your sunscreen. So it's a compound in your sunscreen, PAVA. Um, it is paraminobenzoic acid. So here are the percentages. Um, so what I need to go along with this, I need some information from the periodic table. What I need specifically is I need these atomic masses. So I need to basically take each of those, 1.00794 for the H, 12.0107 for the C, 14.0067 for the N, and 15.9994 for the O. We need that because we're going to work out how many moles of each element are present in 100 grams of the actual sample. So, let's go to it. Okay, so here are all those numbers put together. So I have my percentages and I have my molar masses. So the last piece of the puzzle that we actually need is that we're going to assume a 100 gram sample. So our problem is going to look like this. I'm going to have C to the X, H to the Y, N to the Z and then O to the A. So I need to solve each one of those separately. First, I'm going to take these, if I'm using a 100 gram sample, that means that each of these is just grams. And they add up to 100. So 61.31 grams, 5.14 grams, 10.21 grams, 23.33 grams. Okay, so what I have to do first for each one of those is convert them to moles. So that means this divided by this, and so on, and so on, and so on. And when I do that, I get this. So the first two, basically the same. You can tell they're going to be basically, if I round them to one decimal place, they're identical. Um, the last two, not so much, and I have one that's less than one. So the way I have to do this is normalize them. So that means I'm going to take every number here and divide it by the smallest one. So all of them are going to get divided by that, which means that one's going to end up being a 1. That one is a 2. Specifically, it's 2.0005. So, you know, I'm pretty sure we can say that's 2. This one is 6.996. And this one is 7.003. So, I have to be a little careful with this. We are going to round these to integers, but we don't do that until we're basically at an integer anyway. So, in terms of percentage, you can see these are all almost dead on an integer. I'm not really doing much to say, all right, I'm going to say that's a 7 as an integer. I'm going to say that's a 7 as an integer, and I'm going to say that's a 2. I'm not rounding off much. That's a lot different than trying to round off here in the middle. You can't do that. It's clear that some of those are nowhere within miles of being an integer. Once I divide through by the smallest one, I should be either really close to integers or have some really obvious multiples. Like if I got an answer of 1.5 here, then I'm going to have to double everything. Okay, it's obvious that that 0.5 is not something I can round off, and it's easy enough to fix it. So here, 
I now have answers for all of my numbers. So my empirical formula for paraaminobenzoic acid is this. C7, H7, N1 is implied, and O2. Now, as it turns out, that actually is the molecular formula, but there's no way to be sure of that right now unless you already knew that, which I do. So um, it has to do with benzene. The benzoic acid as part of the name tells you that it's a, a six-carbon attachment and the acid is the seventh. So I know that the from the name, being an organic chemist, that that's a seven-carbon setup. The para-amino, para is about where it's located. The amino is an NH2 group, so that's one N with two H's. And then the, benz the acid part of benzoic acid is a CO2H group, and so I know there's going to be two O's. So from more experience, I could have told you that was the formula. But in this case, the best you could say is that's the empirical formula. It turns out it's the molecular formula as well, but you would need more information or at least more experience to be able to say that based on the name or based on other techniques to tell you what that multiplier might be. In this case, it would be a 1. But for what I did earlier with glucose, it was a 6 from the CH2O formula to C6H12O6. I need a way to get to that multiplier, and as far as you know right now, you don't have one. So all you can say is that this is the empirical formula for what you were given. Specifically, to actually get the molar mass, um, I would need to know, to get the molecular formula, I would need to know the molar mass. Now, I can get that sometimes from a technique called mass spectrometry, um, and I may get it from knowing something else about how the reaction was done, but otherwise... It is an additional step. So for something like uh, paramino benzoic acid, its molecular weight, uh, its molar mass, is exactly the same as what I would get adding up that f empirical formula so that I would be talking about the two being equal. Here's a case where they're not. So if we had worked all that out as an empirical formula, meaning if I only had C and H instead of C, H, N, and O, and they worked out to be 50% each. So I've got one of each in my empirical formula. Well, that's not particularly informative. But if I know from another technique that its molar mass is 78, that's how I get to the multiplier. That's how I figure out how many C's and how many H's are really there in the molecule. How many times does this subunit formula, mass, which is 13, one, uh, carbon is 12, hydrogen is one, so this unit would be 13, grams per mole, how many of those do I have to get to get the right molar mass if I had it from some other piece of information? And the answer is six. So that's when I can say my real formula is six times that. So that means I have six carbons and six hydrogens. But without this additional piece of information, I can't get to a molecular formula. All I'd be able to say is this. From the percent composition, I can get to an empirical formula, and that's as far as I'm going unless I have this additional piece of information given to me or determined by a different technique. Now, how do we get those percentages? We were handed them on a plate. They were just part of the question. Reality is, if we wanted that information in a real lab setting, we'd have to get them from somewhere. And the way we do it is basically called combustion analysis. And that is, we take a sample and it's processed by generally a specialty, a specialty lab, and they put it into a piece of equipment that, that burns it. That gives off for every carbon, carbon dioxide, for every hydrogen, water. So I can actually then collect those, or they as a lab collect those things, and then weigh them. And compare that, knowing the stoichiometry, to your original sample, and you get those percentages. So because you'll have a mass of carbon from this CO2, over the original mass of the sample. That's your percent carbon. So that, that, that's what we had in the, the paramino benzoic acid example, 61.31%. That's where that would have come from, is this mass over the mass of the total sample that was burned would have been 61.31%. So this is the technique involved. There's a separate step for nitrogen and others for sulfur and other elements that are possible. There's not a step for oxygen. Notice that. Oxygen is required to burn the stuff with. So that's your leftovers. If you notice, 
we go back to it, notice it was listed, listed last here. Usually that's basically 100% minus everything else is the percent oxygen. Um, it's the only leftover. It's the one thing that you're not at, that you're not able to calculate directly. You have to do it indirectly by removing all the other things from the sample and taking the leftover as being oxygen. So here's how it looks stoichiometrically. We're going to burn a sample. We're going to basically get out of that a mass of carbon dioxide. We're going to convert that mass of carbon dioxide to moles. That number of moles is the exact same as the moles of carbon in the original sample. I then convert that back to mass using the molar mass for carbon. And I now have my mass of carbon in the original sample. And if I divide that by the mass of the total original sample and make it a percentage, there's my percent C. Same for H, same for N, although the N one's a little more complicated, but that's about it. So H, same way, water, moles of hydrogen. Here they're not exactly the same because there are two H's in one water molecule. So I do have a multiplier here. <laughs> then mass using the atomic mass for hydrogen. That'll give me the mass of hydrogen in my sample. Divide that by the mass of the whole sample to begin with, times 100. There's my percent H. Now, let's look at actually using stoichiometry in a, in, in a reaction, what we can get in and out of it. So, first, I didn't say this earlier, but I have to say it now, and hopefully you learned this in a previous course. You cannot work with an unbalanced equation. Chemical equations have to be balanced to work with them stoichiometrically. You need to know the ratio of molecules coming together before you can produce that proper ratio in mass terms. An unbalanced chemical equation is like an unbalanced person. You definitely don't want to be around them, and you sure as hell don't want to elect them. I'm sorry. Um, so keep that in mind. So what that means here is that if I combine 1H and 1O, I don't get the right ratio to make the product. I have to correct that. I have to balance this. You should have learned how to do that for simple equations in a previous course. Go back and look at it. I'm assuming you can already balance an equation. So... What this gives us is a ratio um, of molecules between the two or of moles between the two. Because remember, we're not going to use the number for calculating moles, but basically it's the same number used over and over again. So that Avogadro's number that does this is the same thing here and the same thing here. So that's why we don't need it, is that we can just go directly from here, our coefficient in the balanced equation, to a number of moles in a fixed ratio. Then, using the molar masses, I can go directly to mass there. And, if I've done it right, it should follow the law of conservation of mass. That, if I add these two together, it's going to give me this, which is also what I get by multiplying this by the molar mass. So that number is my proof of the law of conservation of mass. And that's why it was an important piece. Until you had that, you couldn't do stoichiometry at all, which means you couldn't properly measure any chemical reaction until you had a good understanding of conserving mass. All right, so there are three steps in any stoichiometric question. They sometimes get repeated depending on how complex it is, but they go like this. Take any mass you're given, convert it to moles. That's step one. The balanced equation is your ratio of moles between different substances. The balanced equation is the only way to, to relate substances to each other. So those coefficients are number two. Then take whatever substance you cared about, use its molar mass, go back to mass for it. So it is basically a three-step unit conversion where you're getting two of the conversion factors, what I'm showing here is number one and number three, off the periodic table, adding up the atomic masses to make the molar mass. The middle conversion factor you're getting off of balancing the equation. It's just the ratio of the substances you care about in the balanced equation. So here's the balanced equation for glucose. This is this is um, this is wrong for starters. This is carbon dioxide and water. So 
if I want to know how much water can be produced in this, then that's the ratio I care about. So I need the molar mass for glucose, which is 180 grams per mole. I need the molar mass for water, which is 18 grams per mole. And I need the mole ratio between them, which is the implied one here and the six that's here. So first step, convert the glucose mass to moles. Second step, moles of one substance related to another. So I have to relate them to each other. The balanced equation does this. This is also where you get crushed if you don't balance the equations because a one-to-one -one ratio here is not going to give you a right answer anywhere else down the line because it doesn't happen in a one-to-one -one ratio. It happens in a six-to-one ratio. Think about that in personal terms. You go to, uh, you know, have an argument with somebody. One-to-one -one is not a big deal. If there are six people there, you don't argue with them. The ratio is important. Okay, so third step, go back to mass. Wow, man, this thing is just filled with mistakes. That's 18, not 180. Wow. So uh, apparently if you need a job as a proofreader, Pearson needs to hire you. I'll recommend you. They didn't seem to pay much attention to this. So minor, but still kind of this goes out to every professor teaches out of that book so it's a little bit weird that it has grotesque typos in it like this so as we go along we can we can deal with this pretty quickly so it is three unit conversions as i said earlier one conversion to moles of this first substance two relationship of moles between the two substances three conversion back to mass this number and this number came from the periodic table by adding up the atomic masses the middle conversion factor comes from the balanced equation. So this is a unit conversion question where you have to come up with all of the conversion factors on your own, either from the periodic table or from balancing the equation. Now, we don't include energy in our balanced equations, but we will talk about it soon. It is related. That's common sense. Let me explain that to you. You burn one sheet of paper, you warm your hands over it. You set fire to a paper factory like what happened on Route 80 not too long ago. That's going to be a lot more heat. So the amount of stuff that's reacting is directly going to affect the amount of energy that's produced or required depending on the direction of the reaction. So we will come back to that stoichiometry later. Um, it is directly related, but we need to talk about heat and its transfer separately. So we're not going to introduce that yet, but just keep in mind it is directly related to the same ratios that we're talking about here. If I burn more wood, I'm going to get a bigger fire and I'm going to get more heat. Proportionally more heat. I burn one log, I get such amount of heat. I burn two of them, I get exactly twice as much. So it is stoichiometrically related, but we're not there yet. All right, last piece of the puzzle for stoichiometry is what happens if you don't have the right ratio. Um, it means that the reaction is not going to work properly. It means you're going to run out of something. Uh, it also means you're going to have a contaminated product when it's over because you're going to have leftover starting material in it. That is expensive. You're putting in extra material you didn't use, and then you have to go and clean it up. So you just you just jacked your costs up sky high here in some cases. Um, wasting starting materials and having to clean it up at the end, two things you'd really like to not have to do. Um, think about it. You want chemistry to be efficient. If you're, you know, if the leave you take after you listen to this lecture cost you $27 a pill because chemistry was inefficient, you probably wouldn't buy that product anymore. So doing things efficiently is a big part of doing them in a cost-effective manner, which is important if you ever want to sell anything to the public. People don't like being overcharged for stuff, even in Bergen County. So what we describe as the terms here, if we're going to run out of something that we call our limiting reactant because that limits what we can produce. Once that's used up, the one that's present in the, the, the deficiency, once that's used up, the reaction stops. It does not matter how much of the other stuff I have present. In this case, this is H2 and O2. If I run out of one of those, it doesn't matter how much I have of the other. Nothing's happening. You can't produce stuff without both reactants. If one of them's gone, the reaction's over. Whether you have leftovers or not is your problem. So that's what they're showing here with these. These are waste. You put these in there, they didn't do anything. 
because you ran out. So that's why you have to be careful with reagent amounts. You have to know what's what. So the one that ran out is not the one that's here when it's over. That is not the limiting reagent. That one's still present. I had more than enough of that. What I ran out of here, the white ones, which is H2. So I have leftover O2 because I didn't have these in the proper 2 to 1 ratio from the balanced equation. I had them in a 10 to 7 ratio instead. So the 2 to 1 ratio would have been 10 to 5. So my balanced equation, I would have had 10 of these, 5 of these, there'd be no leftovers. That's ideally how it would work. There are legitimate reasons to push this. Occasionally we can speed things up or make reactions work better by overloading them. So it's not just, it's not always about being sloppy that you didn't measure them out properly in the right ratio. There are reasons to do it, but it does present a problem. You're wasting material going in and you got to clean it up coming out. So even if there's a legitimate reason to do it, it's still a pain because you're putting in more that you're not getting the, the product out from and you're cleaning it up afterwards, which is labor and sometimes extra chemicals that you've got to, you've got to pay for. We don't usually talk about the excess reactant, but that's what we call it. There's more of it than I need so that there's some left at the over. So I had an excess of it. Like I have an excess of debt. The leftovers don't determine what I can make. What limits my ability to make stuff is the limiting reactant, the one that runs out. Again, when that runs out, the reaction's over. I don't care how much, whether I had two extra oxygens or I had two billion of them, I'm not producing another molecule of water if I don't have any H's. So that's the leftovers don't concern me in terms of how much product I could actually get. I'm limited in what I can produce by what runs out of my reactants. So the limiting reactant, the one that's used up completely, is what I use to determine all my calculations for how much product I can actually get. Last couple of number things we're going to talk about. Um, when we look at a reaction in practical terms, we need to consider three things. One, stoichiometry calculations will give us this, what's called a theoretical yield. That is what's possible. Assuming everything works perfectly, that's what I would get. Spoiler alert, you never will see that be the right amount because nobody's perfect, nobody measures perfect, and you never recover 100% of what you put in. Even if the reaction is perfect, you're not. Your equipment is not. So you will basically never match that. You'll get close if you're really good and, and careful and the reaction cooperates, but you'll never exactly match it. What you get in reality and way out in the lab is this. Those two numbers should be real close. If they're exactly the same, that's a little suspicious. But they should be close because you should be doing things right. Your reaction should work most of the time. And you may lose a little bit of material stuck to the glass, but you should get most of what was theoretically possible. The third part of that is the relationship between these two, called the percent yield is what I really got as a percentage of what I should have got. Now, when I was an undergraduate, one of my lab instructors actually used to grade our experiments based on this. So if you got a terrible yield, actually, then you got a terrible grade because the reactions were all chosen to be ones that worked well. So we knew you screwed up, or he knew I screwed up, either way. So this is basically very much like grading, in that theoretically, you'll get 100 questions right. Actually, hopefully you're close, but very rarely is anybody going to be perfect there. And then we put it in as a percentage. So if you get half the questions right, 50 out of 100 times 100%, you got a 50% exam score. Same concept here. What you actually got versus what you should have got as a percentage. 